All right. Hi. Sorry for the weird angle. Uh, doing this solo. <laughs> I don't have an assistant doing the recording. All right. So today we're going to continue our videos and of the ways of feminism. The first wave, the second wave are the first two videos. This third video is going to be the third wave and the fourth wave. So I have video space. So third wave feminism. So remember, we're coming out of second wave feminism. It's the 50s, it's Mad Men, it's pill popping, it's um, Betty Friedan, Simone de Beauvoir. Um, then it's the hippies. <laughs> it's Woodstock, it's free love, it's bra burning. It wasn't really a thing, but it's a good representation of the idea, right? Um, and things were rocking and rolling, literally and figuratively with Woodstock. Um, but then the 80s happened and the 80s just sucked. There's no way around it. I'm a child from the 70s, so I grew up a little bit. I grew up a lot in the 80s. That didn't make sense, right? To grow up a little or a lot in time. <laughs> I was growing up in the 80s and it was a really rough time. There was a war on poverty, a war on drugs, a war on crime, um, crack cocaine debates, HIV, it was just a really intense time. Um, I don't know how to compare it to COVID and pandemics and recessions and crazy politicians, but um, the 80s were really rough. It was rough for politics. The politicians were really brutal. And <clears throat> what ended up coming from that, the 80s, is the war on crime, the war on drugs, the war on everybody, ended up really just being a war on Black and brown peoples, right? It ended up being a war on poor people. It ended up being a war on people who were not the really rich, white, enfranchised people. So the 80s were just brutal for a lot of people. There were, of course, the one percenters who just made mad cash, who were all the politicians, who were all the rage. But really, for the normal person, it was just a really tough time. So nothing really happened with feminism. It was a really racist time. Um, there were a lot of riots. It was just, it was just a really, the 80s were brutal. So when we get to the 90s, there's this kind of backlash to the 80s where people just wanted to drop out of society sort of like the 70s and Woodstock the hippie age coming out of the, the really repressive 1950s with the cold war and all the, the terrible stuff that was happening in the 1950s super super racist super super sexist time of the 1950s we get Woodstock so coming out of the really repressive 80s and super racist 80s we get the 90s and the 1990s. So third wave is the 1990s. I don't think you can see that very well. Let me see if I can turn this a little bit. No, <laughs> sorry for the glare. It says the 1990s, it says third wave 1990. <clears throat> the 1990s was a backlash to the 80s and it was all about grunge, it was a time when everybody, boys, girl, people identified as boys or girls or men or women were all wearing flannel shirts. Um, people were really into skateboard culture. Uh, it was very androgynous in the sense that both um, like young men and women were very, um, everybody sort of had long stringy hair um, or long braids and flannels and jeans and combat boots. Like the boys and the girls looked the same. They were all listening to Kurt Cobain and Nirvana. Um, it was a really cool kind of backlash to um, an oppressive decade before. Also, it's not the beginning of hip hop. The hip hop started in the 70s, um, but it really got really mainstream. So this is when grunge is happening. It also is when hip hop becomes, so these two things are mainstream. Meaning it was in the dominant culture, everybody knew it. Think about people 
kind of androgynous folks like salt and Peppa. I don't know if you remember them. Salt and Peppa were really cool. But what was cool in hip hop culture in the very beginnings in the 90s was the really big baggy pants, the sweatpants, um, even the TLC. Uh, it was very androgynous in a lot of ways, even though the, you know, girls were girls, boys were boys, whatever, but it really still was androgynous way of dressing, of acting. Everybody was cool with each other. Um, it was kind of a cool time. So Salt and Peppa are, are singing songs like, let's talk about sex. You know that song? Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the good things that happened. Okay. So <laughs> that was embarrassing. But so we have women these these women who are grown and they're empowered, but they're wearing baggy clothes. They're not the girls in the bikinis trying to sell a red Porsche, right? They're they're androgynous in their clothing and they're talking about sex. And they're like, let's talk about sex. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about how we want this to work and look like. And it was, as someone who came up in this time, it was really cool. I hadn't seen or heard women take control of themselves like that before. It was really new and it was really, really exciting. Um, the same thing with like Kurt Cobain and um, just all of it. Xena was on TV, Lucy Lawless was playing Xena. Anyway, <laughs> okay, so it was a lot of androgyny that way, mixing of masculine and feminine in a way that was really empowering. So here's the ideas, the, the sort of ideology around this. So. Uh, oh, I also had to put down here Bikini Kill. So Bikini Kill was in the punk rock scene. So this was also, um, took it a step further. Um, and for, it was mostly white girls, but it was also, it was diverse. Bikini Kill, um, which was the riot girl movement. Well, there's only two R's, I guess. Riot girl. So the riot girls were these punk girls and they were Kathleen Hanna and they were just out and they were screaming and they were mosh pits. And um, she did one performance where she danced the whole time naked and not naked. She was in her underwear and a t-shirt. She was just like, don't believe MTV. MTV was a thing. MTV was just created. Don't believe MTV. Don't believe Cosmo magazine. Like this is what a real body looks like. It was Lizzo before Lizzo, right? Um, so all of that was happening. And the music was probably more important than any other wave. Well, outside of like Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin at Woodstock. But the music here really was probably the most empowering. It was speaking directly to the men and women about body acceptance, about um, revolting, about not buying in and having to look a certain way or act a certain way. And that was new. That was really new. Um, so that was, it was a time when the media really pushed the culture. So the other thing that is happening is that the internet started. <laughs> so let me put this over here. So the internet started and it was a very like zine culture magazines culture and blogs that kind of started so when I started college at Temple University I was this community college of Philadelphia student and I started at Temple and when I started there was no email there were no computers I typed my papers on a word processing typewriter and if I wanted a book from the library, I had to go find the Dewey Decimal card and hand it to the librarian. I shouldn't have told you that story because now I feel old AF. But, <laughs> but just in your mind, especially if you're my freshman, sophomore students and you're, you're 18 years old, there was a time before the internet. There was a time before Google and you had to go to concerts and you had to go to the library and it wasn't so easy to connect with people as it is now. It's not so easy to find your people, you know, start a Facebook group for, you know, trans people in their 50s. That's, you can do that now. You couldn't do anything like that at this time. If you, if you, if you wanted to find another person, you had to go meet them on the street somewhere, you know, it was really hard um, to create groups and create connectivity the way we can just sort of do it now with Instagram and Facebook. So that being said, 
the riot girls and the third wave feminists really wanted to redefine feminism to be inclusive. Well, let me not say inclusive. Let me say diverse, even though I don't think it was diverse. I think there was, I think there was still very much a white girl punk scene and grunge. And then there was hip hop for um, black folks over here. I think they were kind of segregated that way, but the idea was, is that there's some diversity in the sense that you could be who you authentically wanted to be. You're not embracing stereotypes. So it's diverse in the sense that it's not stereotyping. So not stereotypes. There's not, they don't, people didn't in third wave in the nineties, we didn't want old isms. People were mixed race and that was honored. Um, people did like natural hair and that was really honored. Um, lots of things just were becoming normalized in a way that was really going against the sort of very traditional white heteropatriarchy. There also was a component of that that recognized um, rape culture. So this is new to third wave feminism. And part of this has to do with Jennifer Baumgartner, Alice Walker, um, or sorry, Rebecca Walker, Alice Walker, who wrote The Color Purple, her daughter. They were these really outspoken third wave feminists. They're coming out, Jennifer Baumgartner is white. Um, Rebecca Walker is has Alice Walker, a black mom and a Jewish white dad. And she talks a lot about coming up in these, these you know, mixed spaces, race and, and just generations. And she's an incredible writer. So if you want to check out Rebecca Walker. And they're really confronting. So third wave feminists are really confronting for the first time before hashtag me too, before hashtag times up, they're confronting rape culture. They're confronting this idea that in a job interview, you don't get to grab my ass. Believe it or not, that was acceptable before that and has happened to me personally on more than one occasion. I mean, back in the day. I had someone reach across a desk and feel my breast during a job interview once and laugh, four men in a room laugh, right? That happened. Nothing, I didn't call the police, nothing happened, right? I was 17, what was I supposed to do? I really had no, in my mind, in the 80s, I had no options. So the 90s were about saying, like, enough to this bullshit. My body is my own. So it really was the first, oh my God, this marker is awful. This first body reclamation. So you all know Beyonce and Lizzo and all sorts of people. There's that model, Ashley something, the plus size models, plus size, they're like normal size, right? And it's, but really this is where it starts. This is the first real body reclamation where women were saying, you don't get to touch me that way. You don't get to come at me that way. You don't get to say, we've gone on three dates. When are you gonna put out? You don't get to talk to me like that anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm out, right? I'm not, go, I'm not going out with you anymore. Where 10 years, 20 years earlier, I would have married that douchebag, right? I would have you know, given into anything, yeah? So third wave really decides I'm done, like I'm done with this music. I'm done with this classist, racist, sexist crap. I'm over it. I'm gonna take my body back. I'm taking my power back. And they had, they were a lot of them activists. So a lot of the women, just by being a woman, just by being a person of color, they became activists. So that characterizes in a very, you know, big overarching way, third wave feminism. So now, fourth wave feminism. This, over, this definitely overlaps with third wave feminism in a lot of ways. And I think that people also argue that there's not a fourth wave feminism. Um, so it depends, you don't have to believe, you know, most of this is just historically true. Um, you don't, it's not like you're believing it or not believing it. It's just historically what happened, right? Like salt and pepper existed, grunge culture existed. Um, <clears throat> the internet started, like these things are just historically accurate. But it gets a little more arguable if you say, 
we are in a fourth wave of feminism. Someone could say, no, we're not, right? So this actually gets, because we're in it, it gets a little more arguable. Have a new marker. So fourth wave feminism, much like third wave feminism, I'm sorry, you can't really see the, I feel like the glare on the board. Let me see if I turn this light off. How's that? Is that a little bit better? Now I just look really in the shadows. No, I don't think that's better. All right, fourth wave feminism says, um, I'm really tired of fighting. <laughs> I'm really tired of fighting for activists and movements and all of this stuff. It's getting kind of exhausting. So the first part that sort of overlaps the third wave, so this is where we're overlapping the third wave, is that women just kind of check out a little bit, honestly. And they end up having the DIY movement, the do-it-yourself movement. So the DIY movement is this idea that like women were doing, making their own shampoo, they're making their own soap. This is where the company, that huge company Etsy comes out of, this idea that I'm going to make my own stuff. I'm going to sell it, barter, like a barter culture, almost. Um, Etsy, there's also things like Red Up, um, Facebook, Marketplace. So all of these things where let's just do for ourselves. Let's get out of Amazon. I don't need to send Jeff Bezos to space again. Five billion dollars for five minutes in space. $5 billion could have fed every single elementary school for the next 20 years. But no, he decided to go to space instead. Listen, that's your life choice. But a lot of people from the third and fourth wave are just so disgusted, right? I think this is really the word. Disgusted. With politicians, disgusted with the one percenters, disgusted with people like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, these people who are just really only in it for themselves, who never think about the community, right? Who never think about that they could solve world hunger and nobody care, right? They don't care. So what fourth wave really comes about and the, like the end of third wave into fourth wave is about this argument between globalism and individualism. So globalism first, individualism. So the slogan over here is um, think global, act local, right? Let's see, think global, act local. Do you remember that phrase? So again, this is just teetering from third wave into fourth wave. The problem though, is that how do you think globally? How do you as a fourth wave, third wave feminist, which I would consider, right? I'm a third wave feminist. I'm in that generation, but now teaching fourth wave feminists. How do I, as a feminist, Think globally, think about all the world because now because of the internet, because of travel, we're so interconnected in a way we never ever have been before. But how do I act locally? Why do I need to act locally? Why do I want to act locally instead of act globally? So here's where this comes in. In fourth wave, it really got shoved into especially Westerners faces this idea of colonization. So this idea that all of these like little college white girls are going to Africa to save the children is actually what seemed like, and to take pictures, right? The blonde hair, the blue eyes, the whole thing, you know, hugging a little, you know, African child. Look what I did on my summer break. I, I don't know. I don't know why I'm making her voice like that, but like I, you know, went and saved all the babies in Africa. Well, <laughs> fourth wave feminists said, that's not your problem. Let Africans take care of their own children. They don't need you. 
right? They don't need you, Western Barbie, to go and do some form of colonization. To think that you're swooping in, this little American doll is swooping in and saving the children of Africa is incredibly, it turns out, condescending, patronizing, <laughs> um, racist, right? It's all these things. So fourth wave feminists now are having a reckoning. We're having a reckoning over what practices um, are actually really problematic even if, but I just thought I was helping. But that's a lot of white privilege. That's a lot of Western privilege. And it's a lot of gender privilege that maybe a female could do that where a male isn't. So we're looking at anti-colonization and really questioning co colonialism and the way it's happening. So just a few days ago, the, the Queen of England, Queen of Britain died. Um, and a lot of people have been like, this queen, she reigned for 70 years. That's incredible. And it is, right? It's a feat that she went from 20 years old to 90 something years old. That's incredible. The problem though, and why there's, there's a lot of backlash, and we shouldn't wish anybody dead, right? People are taking it too far, but is that people wanted paid attention to that she participated in a legacy of colonialism, right? That England took over India, that England took over Australia and a million other places. So, and she was a part of that, right? So both can be true. So here's one of our phrases in the fourth wave. Both can be true. It can be colonization and we can feel like, oh, the queen died. She was an icon, a, you know, a female, I don't know, feminist, but female icon, okay? Both can be true. So in fourth wave, we're looking at a multi-perspectival gaze. We're looking at multi-dimensionality of things. We're not just looking to be in the, in the mainstream or against the mainstream. In fourth wave, we're looking at all of it. We're checking it out. We're drinking at Starbucks, but then we're not shopping on Amazon, right? Like in fourth wave, we kind of do it all. So globalism is the idea that we have that it's all women, right? That women can have all women problems in the sense that we all have to navigate in some way, shape or form if you were born with a womb. Some people weren't, right? And some trans women weren't, right? There's, so there's a lot of things happening there. But if, you know, going with, I was born with a womb, I was born with a vagina, I have to navigate in some way my period, I have to navigate in some way childbirth. Um, there are things that all women, and I put that in quotes, all women have to negotiate. So that, and I'm saying this in a trans friendly way, right? But there's this idea of global womanhood, global womanhood. How do we navigate motherhood? Because we are blessed and cursed with it, right? Even if you're infertile, you still then have to navigate infertility, like in some way, shape or form, you're navigating this, yeah? So there's all women problems. There's all women problems of trigger warnings, rape, and this is especially true for trans women because trans women have much higher rates of sexual assault and murder and especially trans women of color. So all women are navigating in some way, shape or form rape culture. In the Sudan, women are getting raped on their way to the 10 miles they have to walk to go get water at the well. Jayote Singh in India was gang raped on a bus by six men, a public bus, and later died of her injuries. And her rapist said, it takes two hands to clap. She shouldn't have been on the bus at nine o'clock at night, right? So no matter where you are in the world, United States, one in four girls is still sexually assaulted in some way, molested or raped. One in seven boys are. We are all navigating a 
physical embodiment of our gender in some way, shape, or form, okay? So this is global womanhood. All women are dealing with rape culture, pregnancy in some way, shape, or form, motherhood, that kind of thing. The flip side of that coin says individualism. We are not all women. We're not all women experiencing the same thing. So individualism also is like localism. <laughs> women in the Sudan are dealing with very different things than women in the Philippines, are dealing with very different things than the women in New York City. They just are. There is no global womanhood. So this is the flip, this is the opposite argument. There is no global womanhood. In New York City, I'm fighting to make $400,000 a year with my new vice presidency. If I'm in the Philippines, I'm navigating sweatshop labor, right? I'm navigating super corrupt police that are attacking women and then I have to go report the crime to the guy who just attacked me because he's the cop. In the Sudan, I'm looking at civil wars, right? Or in Saudi Arabia, I'm trying to get the right to drive. I'm still dealing with if I'm immoral or improperly dressed in my burqa or niqab, I can be stoned to death publicly, publicly stoned to death. This woman in Saudi Arabia is not navigating what this woman in New York City is. So there is no global feminism, says the other side. There is, it doesn't exist. There is no all woman problem. So one of these is not right or wrong. I'm not arguing for or against either side and you don't have to choose. I'm just saying that fourth wave feminism is actually global diversity and a whole other kind of diversity than just, you know, black, white, Latino. It's not sort of, you know, minimal diversity. The fourth wave feminism now is looking at global diversification. It's looking at the digital divide, who has access to technology versus who has access to water, right? So, Fourth wave feminism is really intense. It's really big. And we would argue it's very activist and at the same time, very regressive. So we have this, um, the Me Too movement, right? Hashtag Me Too. We have Black Lives Matter started by three black women. Then we have white women tipping the vote for Trump. So you've got this diversity of women. You've got white women listening to Donald Trump say, you can just grab women by the pussy. They, you know, I'm a celebrity. I can do anything I want. They don't matter at all. And white women are like, boys will be boys. I'm going to vote for him anyway. Right? He's got 22 counts of sexual assault against him. I'm going to vote for him anyway. He sits with his daughter on his lap, kisses her on the mouth, and talks about wanting to date her. I'm going to vote for him anyway. So you've got that, you know, there's that side. On the opposite side, you've got hashtag me too, hashtag times up, where women are saying there is no more Hollywood casting couch. You don't get to touch me. You don't get to talk to me like that. You're going to pay me equally. Put Harvey Weinstein in jail. So Harvey Weinstein's going to jail, Trump is getting elected president, right? There's this really big divide between how society is taking up women's empowerment, the way women are taking women's empowerment, okay? So lots of different stuff happening. And of course, don't ever forget the intersectionality of that. Fourth wave feminism is also Tamir Rice, George Floyd, um, Sandra Bland, right? There's also just this vast attack on black and brown bodies um, that is historically true and hasn't changed, 
but now is is because of the internet being more and more exposed like the 17 year old young woman who videotaped for eight minutes and 46 seconds George Floyd's murder stood there had the strength and wherewithal to stand there and videotape this so that the whole world could be exposed to this terrorism was so brave and I'm assuming probably forever traumatized yeah probably forever traumatized but what she did was feminist activism it was a human rights activism Right? So that's fourth wave. We're looking at human rights. We're looking at tearing down the patriarchy because it hurts men as much as it does women. Bell hooks. Okay. So that's third wave and fourth wave feminism. And I'll see you around the classroom or around the internet. <laughs>